All right, so welcome to the unit on energy. What we're going to talk about here is how our body uses energy at the cellular level, what it takes to bring energy in, and the pathways of energy production used by pretty much the majority of life on the planet. So to start out with, what we want to look at is the cell. You know, we, we talked about the cell in, in the cell unit, so we're going to go back over a lot of the basics. This should sound real familiar, but we're going to now start to apply the cell structures to the energy aspect. We, well, all life has to have energy. Without energy, we won't survive. So an active muscle cell uses millions and millions of ATP every single second. And if you lose that energy source, two to three minutes, cells begin to die. It's an incredibly important thing to remember. Lack of energy means cell death. All right, so let's start with membrane structure and function, the cell membrane, or we can call it the plasma membrane. All cells on Earth have this membrane. It's made up of phospholipids, so our fats and our proteins. So when we're looking at the cell membrane, we want to keep in mind, here are the phospholipids making up the structure here. And then here are the proteins that play other roles in the cell membrane. So we've got phospholipids, one part of it, the head is what's called polar, and the tails are nonpolar. These are going to be the majority of the membrane. Okay, so cell membranes are composed of phospholipids and, oh, and proteins. Okay, so phospholipids, right here, this is a phospholipid bilayer. Bi refers to two. So you have water outside of your cell, out here, water inside the cell. Here it is. And then the phospholipids make this barrier, this membrane. Heads of the phospholipids are polar. This means these guys like water. Tails are nonpolar. These, this part of the phospholipid doesn't like water. So the key is, whenever we look at a membrane, heads of the phospholipids face the water, tails face away from the water. And that's why it orientates itself into this bilayer where tails face tails, heads face out to the water. So if something by chance were to push its way through that cell membrane, kind of wiggle in through here, it's going to spread apart those phospholipids and that could potentially allow water to leak in and touch the tails. Well, the, the membrane is going to actually slam shut, close in on itself, and keep the water from getting into or near the tails here. All right, so some terms to remember, definitely important terms. When we talk about a phospholipid, the heads are hydrophilic. This means it loves or likes water. Tails are hydrophobic. This means it fears water. Okay, hydro means water, philic means you like it, phobic means I'm afraid of it. I don't like it. Think about arachnophobia or agoraphobia or whatever phobia somebody may have. Phobia is a fear of. So this works perfectly for these phospholipids to create the bilayer. Now within the membrane, we will also have other structures. The membrane is a complex structure. There's a lot of different things there associated with the cell membrane. So we will have things called glycolipids, these are fats associated with the cell membrane. So you got this little structure here, glycolipid. We have glycoproteins, other cell structures that are attached to the membrane. And a lot of times these are used as identification markers. You have a unique structure for your glycolipid and your glycoprotein. That structure was built based upon your DNA code. This is what gives your cells and your body it's genetic identity. Okay, so when we start looking at cells, we'll talk more about these identification markers in a minute here when we're discussing the cell membranes. But 
keep in mind the proteins. Proteins are important structures. And there's a whole bunch of different functions of cell proteins or proteins associated with the cellular membrane. So DNA instructs the code to create the protein. Pop quiz, what structure in the cell builds the protein based on the DNA code? Let's see if you guys can remember that one, because it's going to come back. So once the proteins are built, they get packaged, they get shipped, and maybe the protein gets embedded into the cell membrane, and it acts as a channel protein. Now a channel protein is just a tube. It's a tube that allows these molecules to move into the cell or to move out of the cell. So as long as those molecules can fit, they will naturally diffuse through the cell membrane. So one of the important cell structures we want to remember, because this is going to come back to us when we get to genetics, is the channel protein. Now the channel protein should be a straight tube. But if for some reason our genetic code is altered and our channel protein is not a straight tube, and it's kind of this bent tube structure I'm trying to draw here, that causes a problem. It does not allow chloride ions to diffuse through the cell membrane and actually come out of the cell. This leads, up, leads to mucus collecting in the airways, pancreatic, liver ducts, etc. This is a genetic disorder known as cystic fibrosis. So we're going to re come back to cystic fibrosis. So I definitely want you guys to remember this one. The channel proteins play an incredibly important role with cystic fibrosis. So it's just one cell protein, one type of protein associated with the cell membrane. Another one here is called a carrier protein. Now carrier proteins allow molecules to move in and to move out. They don't diffuse. They don't just slip in on their own naturally. It takes a little bit of effort. And the carrier proteins are going to be selective. They're going to interact with specific molecules, allowing them to cross the membrane. So they get a little picky. It's still based on size, though. Size is an important issue when we're talking about movement through the membrane. Okay, so remember that size of the molecule is very, very important to get through the cell membrane. Now, sometimes the proteins act as a recognition protein. So here's our cell recognition protein. Okay, so here's a glycoprotein. We talked a little bit about those. That structure right there, this is what gives your cell its genetic identity. So when your white blood cells are cruising around your body and they're looking for things that don't belong, they're checking this ID. They're looking at that little protein structure saying, do you have the right shape? If you have the correct shape, I'm not going to do anything. If you don't have the correct shape, I'm going to attack it. I'm going to destroy it. So if that cell, that white blood cell, came across a glycoprotein that had maybe this kind of shape, it would attack it. It would try to kill it. It would try to destroy that glycoprotein and destroy the cell that contains that type of protein because that cell doesn't belong there. That cell maybe is a bacterial cell or some pathogen that's infecting your body and your immune system is going to destroy it. Now the problem is sometimes our immune system gets confused and it attacks things that it shouldn't. You guys have ever heard of autoimmune disorders? Rheumatoid, arth rheumatoid arthritis is probably the best example. Your immune system is attacking your own body cells, and it shouldn't. It's confused. That's a problem. So, okay, uh, another protein here is a receptor protein. Now, receptor proteins have specific shapes. So this particular shape right there fits into that protein. So it's very, very specific to allow a certain molecule to attach to the protein, kind of like a lock and key idea protein and the molecule attach and then that causes a reaction within the cell. So 
sometimes we're learning about genetic disorders where people have a problem with the receptor proteins. It doesn't allow the interaction of that molecule because of the shape of the protein. Uh, when we get into biotechnology, we'll talk a little bit about pharmacogenomics. And the idea is, can we create drugs that specifically fit your receptor protein? Because we're all a little different. Our receptor proteins are all very, very different. And if the drug doesn't interact with your protein, you can't produce the results that the drug is intended to produce. So, we'll re again, we'll revisit a lot of these things. So, get them under your belt now and make sure you're comfortable with them as we keep going through other units. So, okay, um, last one, enzymes, enzymatic reactions. Enzymes are proteins. These accelerate the rate of reactions. They help speed it up and make it go super fast, incredibly quick, and this is what we basically survive off of is the rate of these reactions. So as we're talking about energy production, talking about metabolic pathways and things like that, enzymatic proteins play an incredibly important role in determining those pathways and the functionality of those pathways. It's again, it's just speeding it up, making it happen faster. So, okay, so a quick little review for you. Protein type, what I will encourage you guys to do, fill in the blank. What's the protein function? Go through each of these, fill it in, do it from memory. And then go back and check your work. So fill that out. What is the function of the receptor protein? What is the function of the recognition protein? What is the function of each of these proteins? Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with the protein type and the protein function. All right, so just a quick little review for you there. So, all right, now as we're talking about membranes, molecules are constantly moving around and the membranes are picky about what goes through them they're we call it selective we say oh they're selectively permeable meaning certain things will permeate or go through the membrane going into the cell certain things go out of the cell and the number one factor that determines what goes in and what goes out is size can't stress that enough. Size is the number one factor that determines which proteins, which molecules, which nutrients, which whatever go into the cell, come out of the cell, go through the cell membrane. So if you're too big, you can't get through that membrane, like our macromolecule down here. Notice this guy here. Too big. Try to get through the membrane, bounces off. These little non-charged molecules, small, right in, water, in and out. Charged molecules, oh, too big and the charge doesn't work. Charged molecules bounce off of the membrane. Whether they're inside trying to go out or outside trying to go in, doesn't work. Okay, so the molecules are constantly moving around and only certain molecules will just easily freely move through the membrane, like there's no barrier at all. Now, molecules are moving, constantly moving around. And the term we use for that, for the movement of molecules, is diffusion. All right, so diffusion is the movement of molecules from a high to a low concentration. All right, there's no energy required. This is just natural molecular motion, high to low concentration. Sugar in your coffee. <laughs> Smell cookies baking in the kitchen. Oh man, I spilled spaghetti sauce on my shirt and it spreads and stains. Those are all examples of diffusion. So diffusion, again, is molecules naturally moving from a high concentration to a low concentration, and it does not require any type of energy source. 